Thank you. Okay, so we're going to be talking about ultra large scale complex adaptive systems, a nice long phrase. And it doesn't uh, lend itself really to a nice acronym, U L S C A S, but um, it is what it is. We're going to start off in the past. Uh, the profession, the first things that we were out there trying to do is we were trying to build artificial reality. So we would see something in the real world and we would try and build a computer equivalent of it. Sometimes it was things that we think we see in the real world. So uh, obviously uh, back in the 60s, 70s, you were building apps for things like payroll programs. Something that, yeah, you can see it over there, you can see a whole bunch of accountants over there working on the problem, gauging the paychecks. It has a very firm reality, and you can implement it or simulate it on a computer system or even replace it. Nobody does payroll manually anymore. It's always on a computer system. We look out there and we see human beings thinking, and we think we understand what that is, and so we try to build artificial uh, replicants of human thinking, or we even get ambitious and think that maybe we can even create an artificial replicant of a human being and create data uh, on the Star Trek Enterprise, Star Starship Enterprise. Uh, robotics technology, I have Isaac Asimov up there, he's very, very famous for uh, creating the, uh, the whole robot series and the first three laws of robotics. There is a zeroth law of robotics, but the robots discovered that one, not, not Asimov. Uh, we started saying, oh, gee, we're really good at this. We can actually create artificial reality situations. So this picture down here at the bottom of the embracing uh, colorful couple uh, is from a really horrible, horrible movie called Lawnmower Man, which uh, nevertheless has a, a very strong cult following. So we think we can actually create in our computers all of reality out there. Uh, and of course, right now we're in the midst of a huge hype again of artificial intelligence. And we have Deep Blue lately, uh, Nee Watson, or Watson Knee Deep Blue, uh, that wins at Jeopardy. So he beat Ken Jennings, who is the all-time earnings winner on Jeopardy, and the guy that won the most shows uh, on Jeopardy. Um, we think we see it in the real world, we think we can uh, replicate it on computers. The last decade or so has seen a lot of emphasis on augmented reality. Uh, we don't really want to create something in the machines, we want to start overlaying the machines on the world. We want to interject or overlay or insert things back into the real world that we've created in our, our labs. Um, games are kind of an intermediary thing. A game exists in the computer, but they are so engaging and so on that we started to get the idea, well, gee, why don't we see if we can take the same kind of idea or notion uh, that we have in creating a gaming world and apply it to the real world, to augment the, the real world reality. Uh, this got a huge amount of emphasis about two years ago when World of Warcraft, one of the first uh, multiplayer online games, uh, recorded its one billionth player hour. Uh, hasn't been around that long, what, 10 years, something like that? And there are one billion player hours in that one online video game. And people says, well, why are people spending so much time there and are so reluctant to spend so much time in the office. Let's make the office like the game. Uh, and you have this notion of gamification, which has been a very uh, serious trend or an attempt to do trend. You have science fiction writers writing about it, like Daniel Suarez and Michael John Williams, Walter John Williams. Uh, Pokemon Go was a huge hit a few years ago with this augmented reality that you had to actually go out and walk around in order to find the, uh, the creatures that you were looking for. Uh, telemedicine and things of this sort are, again, they're a way to superimpose things that the computer can now, uh, or computer can calculate really, really fast, and then overlay that onto what it is the surgeon is seeing through the cameras of the patient, 
and increase or enhance uh, the success rate of the surgery. But all of these are just different kinds of examples of augmented uh, reality. Now we are in the process of actually going out and trying to directly change reality. We're taking this complex system that all of us live in and we're trying to make direct changes to it. Uh, starting with the built context. So this whole idea of ubiquitous computing, let's put a computer chip or a processor in absolutely everything. You're not let yet sitting on a smart chair, but I wouldn't bet that you won't be in the near future, particularly in a classroom or a lecture hall or something of this sort, where the professor could sit up here and look around and zap that seat right there uh, with a little jolt of electricity to the left buttock. Um, you know, it has great advantages. I can see them already. Uh, but we have to put all of this computing power into uh, the world around us, and then we have to create an interface to it. So we have the notion, the complementary notion of ambient computing, uh, how, we, how we interact with this world around us. And it very quickly alters the reality. So how many of you have any clue, any idea, what it means to say, hey, Siri, Is it a totally meaningless phrase, or is it something that has become so pervasive that it's just a cliche? Everybody knows automatically what it is. You've changed the reality of how people interact with their world. Xerox Park started a project about 15 years ago called the Smart Matter Project. And since then, there have been a lot of uh, copies or parallel kinds of research or investigations. But the Smart Matter Project at Xerox Park was intended to take computing power down to molecular scale. Uh, Alex, or uh, Drexler, blanking his first name, but Drexler also wrote about this nanotechnology starting a number of years ago. But the idea was you could have actually a smart toner particle so that uh, when, you, when the, the uh, copier scanned a document, figured out where all the pixels were, it would give marching orders to each particle of toner, which would then automatically take itself to the right place on the uh, copy paper. And you wouldn't have to have these jets and calibrate the, uh, the jets and the force of the jets turning these toner par particles out onto the, uh, uh, the paper. Or, you could take the piece of paper, and each little molecule of that piece of paper could be a homing beacon for toner. So if the homing beacon was on on this particular pixel on the piece of paper, because the paper is now intelligent, it's smart matter, uh, then the toner part particles would go there. So it's a matter of where you want to put the intelligence, uh, the computation, in the toner particle or in the paper. Either one should work, but the idea is to take computation down to that level. Uh, uh, Drexler and some of his colleagues actually built a springs and levers computer that they could build, or I think they built at least one prototype, at nanoscale. So your molecule could have an onboard computer because nanoscale is smaller than the molecular scale. It'd be a mechanical computer, which is really, really interesting not a electronic or digital one, uh, but an analog uh, springs and, and rods and levers. Uh, the picture is from an MIT project, and they obviously haven't gone down to molecular or nanoscale level, but they build these little robots uh, that unfold, and you can see the computational and computing the electronics inside of each one of these little things, but you can program. Uh, so you could have self-assembling Lego bricks. Uh, you just write your little program, send a broadcast message out to the box of Lego bricks, and they automatically assemble themselves into a castle or a dinosaur or anything of your little heart's desire. Um, I'm hearing chucklings. This is real. This is in the lab. It'll be in the toy store by next year. So... Um, 
But now we've got to move into the natural context. We've got to actually start taking seriously the fact that the world is a complex place. And it's a natural complex system. Uh, it has lots of very, very interesting features. Uh, we don't know anything about it. Everything that we know about the, this complex system, which is the natural world, is primarily metaphor. So none of these images up there, except maybe the center one, is any kind of an attempt to um, model or represent or understand. Instead, we have these images of Gaia or earth goddesses of different kinds, uh, different shapes, or we just say, hey, look, it's the planet out there, that big blue marble, which is a really nice metaphor for this complex reality system. But moving this next step, which isn't happening yet except in small cases, uh, is something that is it going to be a challenge. Uh, the exemplar of this kind of complex system is the web, not the internet. The internet is a deterministic uh, system, the, the underpinning, the infrastructure. But the web itself is one of these very large-scale, complex adaptive systems that cannot be engineered. Nobody could have engineered the web. Nobody could have done anything except build an infrastructure, uh, a URL language, the TCP IP, which was borrowed, uh, the uh, uh, hypertext language for, for these links, things of this sort. We could invent some kind of underpinnings, but then it just took off and effloresced on its own uh, and became what it is. But it could not have been conceived and or engineered. So what do we do? If this is our um, challenge of the future, how do we go about thinking about, let alone building, these uh, ULS, CAS kinds of systems? And Alan Quay K was quoted uh, by Avraham earlier, or by uh, Matthias introducing Avraham, uh, the, about the right response. Per, uh, right perspective being worth a whole lot of IQ points. Um, Matthias said 80, the quote I found said 40, but uh, it's, it's kind of an exponential scale a little bit, so it doesn't really matter. It means you're really, really smart if you've got the right perspective. But it's going to be a radically different perspective than what you're currently used for. Is magic the right perspective? Uh, for a user interface, it might be. Uh, if you think about all of these different devices, each of which with its own idiosyncratic interface or operating system or command set, you very rapidly get to the point of needing something that allows people to make sense of, to integrate, uh, to simplify this command set. Uh, I remember computing back in the days of DOS and having to remember this arcane uh, command line interface uh, that you had to memorize, you know, hundreds of these different kinds of commands in order to interact with your computer. Uh, even users had to uh, memorize a significant number of those, of those individual commands, and it's not easy. But if you go back in our history, to a point where our species was not yet as intellectually developed as we are today, uh, they lived in a world where everything around them was, in fact, already smart matter. Computing power, intelligence was diffused throughout the material universe. Uh, and it was confusing, but they invented a way of coping with it, and that way of coping with it was magic. So you can have spells. You can have magic words um, that allow you to interact with, talk with, supplicate, um, uh, give devotion to the material world around you. And the remarkable thing about it is that people could remember a lot of it. It was a preliterate time, so it was everybody at that point in time also had the ability to like memorize the Iliad or something of this sort. So things are a little bit different, 
But in general, we can make sense of something like a mythology and the magic that goes along with it and use that as a foundation or a basis for designing or thinking about user interface design. Now, if any of you here in the audience are UX or user experience or even uh, human computer interface designers, uh, this is probably an idea that has never occurred to you. But it's an example of how far uh, how radically different your perspective is going to have to be in order to confront uh, this new challenging world. Uh, macros and objects get to be demons and gins, and so you can create these little macros and send them out there and, uh, and supplicate them, ask, use them as intermediaries uh, to get to the real stuff. I actually presented a paper on this in 1994 or 5 uh, at the Uppsala Conference in Minneapolis, um, if you ever want to go and, and look at it. And in the paper, I took it from beyond the interface, actually, into the way they think about doing computing and doing programming and development. The reason that you're going to need this fairly radically new kind of a perspective are these five very, very significant kinds of challenges that you're going to have to deal with uh, in order to design and build these systems. Uh, these five were first identified uh, in a report that was conducted by Carnegie Mellon University. They were the lead on this report. They attracted the best and the brightest about 20 some odd people on this uh, committee, and they looked into, at the behest of the Department of Defense in the United States, who was already feeling the need for building these very large scale kinds of systems, and they didn't have a clue, and they didn't have a clue how to ask the computing community to do it. So these people looked at the problem, analyzed the problem for some period of time, and recognize these five areas, autonomy, decentralization, erosion of the people, computing boundary, which is a corollary or uh, closely associated with erosion of the physical boundary between the computing and the physical. And then one of the biggest ones is this continuous evolution and change. Um, so let's start with decentralization. Anybody here administer a database or have a database in your organization? Can't exist in the future. <laughs> Got to get rid of it. Got to get rid of centralization. Uh, it creates a bottleneck. It creates single points of failure. Um, one of the things that we know about large-scale systems, or most of what we do know about large-scale systems, comes from looking at things like biology or anthropology, uh, cultural systems. And we know in those systems that there is no such thing as centralized anything. Everything is dispersed. Uh, and that also becomes a key to autonomy, by the way. But uh, we need to think also just in terms of what we do when we sit down as programmers. Uh, the way that we think about and design our software itself, or a single individual program itself. So you're all good modular programmers, uh, but I would bet that almost all of your programs, you know, nice set of subroutines and so on, but you all have a main routine. And the main routine is where you put all your intelligence uh, in that program. It's somewhere in the main routine is the logic that determines which subroutines are called in which order and what, to ha what should happen if something goes awry, something goes wrong. Uh, with one of those subroutines. And so your main is the most complicated and the largest part of your program uh, for most people, particularly when you start writing really big programs. In fact, you may have a main program that controls a whole bunch of other programs, each with their main routine. This, the reason that you do this is that it was drummed into your head from day one that that's exactly what you were supposed to do. Uh, this program structure chart up here at the top of the page for generating a payroll, uh, that's from the 1960s and 70s, uh, the very earliest days. Uh, you know, software engineering was invented in 68, and this was the model of programming that was developed in 68 through 72 
and popularized and taught in all of the schools, this is the right way to design your program. Um, and it's so ingrained that when something came along like objects or agent-based programming, nobody could do it because they couldn't get outside this mindset of control. Even the most famous object-oriented uh, architecture is model view controller. So the idea of having this kind of centralized control over uh, what's going on in your software uh, has got to go. It won't work. It won't scale. So what does it mean to decentralize your software? Picture of two airports. Atlanta Airport, Atlanta Hartsfield Airport is the world's busiest airport both in terms of takeoffs and landings per year and in terms of passenger traffic per year. Um, Chicago O'Hare is number two in takeoffs and landings. Dubai is number two in terms of take, uh, numbers, people going through the airport, uh, passengers uh, process. This little airport over here is Whitman Field in Wisconsin in the United States. And for one week a year, they hold a, an air show. It is the premier air show in the world. And they have, during that single week, 17,800 takeoffs and landings from an airport with two runways. The second one is in the background and kind of goes at an angle. It's not easy to see in the, in the picture. Two runways, one control tower. Uh, and they handle, if you annualize that 17,800 per week to a year, they would have more takeoffs and landings than Atlanta uh, by 40,000, 45,000, something like that. Atlanta has three different levels of control tower. They have people for the apron and the area right around the buildings. Uh, which also has as a secondary duty keeping track of the uh, ground traffic, the gasoline trucks and the luggage trolleys and things of this sort, all of which have to be uh, controlled from the control tower. They have another one for the taxiways and they have another one for the runways. And they have between five and 11 air traffic controllers in each one of those towers, depending upon time of day, uh, a variety of other kinds of factors. So it requires that kind of, tra of uh, control to get people on and off the field safely uh, in Atlanta. Uh, Atlanta has had more accidents, by the way, than have ever occurred at Oshkosh. In Oshkosh, they have one tower, controls everything, uh, and it is operated by between three and five volunteer air traffic controllers. So how in the world do they manage to get all of those people up and off the ground safely uh, in Oshkosh that they can't do in Atlanta? One thing is the federal government gives you special flight rules for Oshkosh. So they relax some of the rules about you know, spacing and things of this sort uh, that, that Atlanta doesn't have to operate under. That, that's, that's one thing. But the biggest thing that they do is that they decentralize the control. So at any given point in time, you have a thousand people flying around in and out of the airport. Uh, they are all operating on a single open frequency. So everybody in that system does nothing more than say, here I am, this is my intent. Uh, you know, they use their coded airline, air pilot uh, vernacular, of course, but that's the intent of the message. Here I am, here's what I'm planning to do. And this is broadcast, everybody else in the air hears this, this message. And they self-organize themselves into a coherent uh, landing pattern, flight pattern. They figure out how to stay away from each other uh, but because some people are less or more observant than others, the control tower is still there to do exception handling. So the control tower is sitting here monitoring all of this traffic flowing around, and occasionally you'll hear 
uh, control tower saying something on this same open frequency, by the way, uh, that I noticed that the, uh, the Cessna 152 is a little bit close uh, to the uh, Learjet in front of it. Uh, yeah, the Learjet looks like it's fast, but it's actually slowing down more than you are because it has to get to a lower landing speed faster. Uh, so the, the air, air traffic controllers are doing nothing except looking for exceptions and providing information about those exceptions to the pilots. But control is decentralized, it's among all of the pilots, and it works very well. Like I said, Oshkosh has had fewer accidents per takeoff and landing than, than Atlanta. Continuous evolution and adaptation we know nothing about, uh, really, except for the fact that it's scary because it's accelerating all the time. So biological evolution uh, proceeds uh, in eons. It takes a long time to evolve a human being out of um, you know, our, our genetic ancestry. Long, long time. If we had to wait for Aquaman to evolve, uh, we would be here for an even longer time. If we wanted to wait until Superman evolved and could live on the moon or in airless space, we'd be here for a very, very long time. Geological evolution is slow. As a way of accelerating biological evolution, uh, culture came into existence. Cultural evolution is really quick, relatively speaking. It's still generational. Cultural changes almost always are generational in duration, sometimes two uh, generations, but that, that's kind of the pace of change. And so instead of evolving uh, fat layers like a polar bear and fur, like a polar bear, we invent the parka, made out of polar bear. Uh, and it allows us to work in the same kinds of environments or live in the same kinds of environments as the polar bear does. Technological innovation and the forces for adaptation that it imposes is measured in years. Uh, sometimes less, sometimes five years, 10 years, but it's years between an innovation and the need to adapt to that innovation. Um, and it's hard, it's a, it's a huge challenge. Uh, look at how many bookstores went out of existence because they couldn't adapt to and compete with Amazon uh, or with a net-based technological innovation. Uh, internet time is measured in weeks and people talk about this a lot. Uh, the software community kind of, sort of, semi started talking about this uh, in the early 2000s when Kent Beck published XP, the subtitle of which was Embrace Change. Uh, most of you probably skipped right over the subtitle, uh, but that's probably the most important part of the book is that he was trying to say, here's a way that we can keep up with the demand. And it didn't work. At the time that he wrote the book and was talking about doing these kinds of changes, the average time for a, you know, the average project in the business, uh, business context was 18 months from proposal to delivery. It's still 18 months on average. Hasn't changed a bit. But the business is changing uh, much faster than that. And so by definition, if you're taking 18 months to respond to a change that needs an adaptation in two weeks, you are failing your client. And that's one of the biggest reasons that we still haven't got very much above 34% of the systems that we build for a business environment are successful. 64, 66% of what we do is wasted. How are you going to change and adapt to this kind of thing? Erosion of the physical system, phys the system physical world boundary uh, is, is actually not new. When I, my first job was in a uh, computer room. Uh, the computer room had a raised floor. 
and it had, I don't know, a 50,000 ton air conditioner, some, some absurdly high thing, because the machines couldn't run if they got warm, got hot. Uh, the fact that we're now using water-cooled computers instead of air-cooled computers doesn't change the fact that if the water main breaks out in front of your office, your computing is dead because the machine just simply can't run. The power grid is an even better example of this kind of erosion of the boundary. Um, Signals, information traffic, is going across the same transmission lines as the electricity that it's serving. Uh, the uh, intelligence and the control and so on is embedded in the transformers. Uh, and just as an aside, if any of you live in the United States or are planning to visit there soon, uh, the NSA, the emergency preparedness, the... Uh, uh, the entire government <clears throat> are all convinced that there's a 100% chance in the next 20 years of the power grid failing in the United States, which is kind of scary because in a place like New York City, you have less than a day's supply of food in the grocery stores and no way of getting power to get it there. Uh, the sewer system will overflow by noon on the day of the, uh, the, that it goes out, if it goes out in the early morning. Uh, because there's no pumps and regulators. You won't have any water in your house. You'll be worse than Cape Town at uh, day zero in three months. Uh, and we have built that system, and we have created these kinds of integrations with the physical environment such that a change in the physical environment can very easily bring down the entire grid. Um, very simple kind of... Uh, uh, North Korea, we worry about them sending missiles at, at the U.S. Uh, all they would really have to do is take one of their tankers and put an atomic bomb in it and set it off off the coast of L.A. and it'll take down the power grid, uh, guaranteed. Uh, but even worse, uh, we are trying to insert computing into the existing uh, world. So we have intelligent cockroaches, well, we have cockroaches with little computers on their back that we can release in the Russian embassy so that they can go around and see what all the diplomats are saying and doing inside the embassy. And who notices? It's a cockroach, right? That one they would probably notice because the controller is kind of big still. Um, but the controllers are getting smaller, cockroaches are getting bigger, and there's always those really cool African cockroaches that are about this long. Uh, imagine the computation you could put on one of those. Um, but there are chemical computing. There's a whole field of chemical computing where you use the molecular bonding between different kinds of chemicals in order to uh, perform computations of various kinds. So you could have an intelligent swamp, just put the right mix of chemicals in there, uh, add the right catalyst, and pretty soon your swamp is computing like crazy. And I mean that. Uh, better yet, we have a lot of people working on DNA and RNA computing so that they're making a DNA string programmable. Uh, your DNA string is roughly 80% um, program and 20% data. The, the program is the actuators, the so-called junk DNA, or the actuators that tell which genome to express itself in which kinds of circumstance. So you can go in and change the dark matter as soon as we understand it just a little bit better. You can go in and change the junk DNA to reprogram the data or use the data in different kinds of ways and create all kinds of uh, new interesting things. Right now they're just using it for computing. But with CRISPR technology, uh, which is so inexpensive that your average high school lab could have one, if not your average hacker could have one, you can actually hack the DNA and create new species. Um, we have given ourselves a great deal of power and unlike Spider-Man, we haven't assumed a great deal of responsibility. 
a corollary to the uh, integrating people, or uh, you know, changing the uh, computation physical boundary, is the people boundary. Human beings are going to necessarily be computational components in ultra-large scale systems. And we have never thought about this very much. I could only find one example of where someone tried to uh, create a system that leveraged a human being instead of trying to replace them. In the cartoon up there, uh, the step two that he's supposed to be more explicit at, you can replace then a miracle happens with then a human happens. And then you can go on with your computational processing. So that's what I mean by integrating a human being as a computational element in the system. Uh, back in the uh, 90s, the uh, buzzword of the day was expert systems, and anybody that didn't have an expert system running their business by 19 or by 2000 would be out of business, according to Edward Feigenbaum, great computer scientist, a um, famous computer scientist. Um, one of the attempts, this is the only thing that I, I found, like I said, of trying to integrate a human being into a system. At that time, American Express was unique in terms of credit cards. You did not have a credit limit. So every time you went into some place and wanted to make a purchase with your American Express credit card, uh, that uh, request was sent back to the American Express company, and they had four to 10 seconds, something like that, to give an answer back. In order to do that, American Express had 21 computer screens full of data on all of their customers. And this could be things like your employment history and your income level and your bank balance, uh, your uh, purchasing history. Uh, but the, the person had, had to sit there and say, gee, is David really going to buy a Van Gogh and is he really going to pay us back the $180 million? Um, and make that decision very, very rapidly. Uh, based on some experiences with other companies doing expert systems, they decided that they could build an expert system uh, to make these decisions for them. And of course, it was a horrible failure because expert systems can't deal with multiple experts. And there were multiple experts in American Express, each of whom made equally valid and equally quick decisions with minimal risk but they did it differently because they were different people. They had their own idiosyncratic means. So American Express didn't want to give up. So what they did is instead is that they analyzed their top 10 um, approvers, uh, whatever they were called, uh, and um, saw how they did their work. And they discovered, well, there's a pattern in which screens these people look at first. And so they made the expert system one that optimized or figured out which screens to show which person in which context uh, in order to give them the work that, or the material, the information that they needed uh, to complete their, their, their task. But the computation, the decision making was left in the human being. Autonomy is perhaps one of the most challenging of these uh, issues. Is, uh, it's part of, uh, decentralization is part of autonomy. You've got to move all of your control, all of your uh, processing, decision making down to the finest grain possible. Uh, that was also mentioned uh, this morning in the, in the keynote. Uh, but then you run into all kinds of things, you know, like what happens if these things go rogue? There's no undo. You can't bring them back into the shop for reprogramming. They have to be reprogrammed in place in order to um, you know, meet this pace of change requirements and the system requirements in a complex system. Um, kill buttons, a broadcast message. You know, every, every object, it's like a recall notice for a bad car. Send out a recall notice and tell all of these objects to uh, get rid of themselves. Uh, <clears throat> and it brings with it new ways of thinking about how you coordinate all of these little system elements with their autonomy. Uh, 
One of the areas that's kind of semi-scary is what they're doing with drones and swarming drone technology, where they create quasi-intelligent drones, very small ones, uh, that do not in and of themselves have a great deal of uh, uh, intelligence, but they can collectively, they can have a great deal of intelligence. And you can program in ways that they would, for instance, swarm on an enemy. So you can imagine being, you know, walking through a, a sunny field and someone says you're a terrorist and all of a sudden you have uh, 10,000 uh, killer bee-sized drones coming in and stabbing you with little uh, needles full of some kind of toxin. The U.S. Department of Defense, the U.S. military, already has that capability of doing swarming drones. But we trust them, right? Uh, why does it matter uh, whether we solve this problem or not? It's because you are changing the world. I mean, you are very literally, unequivocally changing the world that you are going to have to live in and your children are going to have to live in. So you want them to grow up to be batteries uh, in the matrix? Uh, that's a real humane kind of future to think of uh, people. Do you want Skynet to take over? Uh, the singularity is, again, it's gotten a huge amount of attention recently. Uh, we have people like Ray Kurzweil, who's ready to be a cyborg. You know, he wants the singularity to happen tomorrow so he can upload himself to a robot body and live forever. On the other end of the spectrum, we have Stephen Hawking, who says, hey, this is an existential threat to humanity itself, that if we don't figure out what we're going to do when the singularity comes, we won't be here. So it's your future. All of this implies a sixth challenge, uh, and that is you. Uh, in order to deal with these large-scale complex adaptive systems, you need to have more than programming expertise. You need to have teams that consist of more than programmers and testers and analysts. Um, the uh, design community and the business community has been aware of this for a number of years. And their ideal employee is a modern polymath. Uh, the Leonardo uh, diagram, which all of you have undoubtedly seen, is called the Vitruvian Man. Man is the measure of all things, named after Vitruvius, who is considered to be the first architect. And this is what, in 25 BC, Vitruvius said an architect had to have this broad range of skills from medicine to astronomy to law uh, to art. So this is the challenge. So OK, how do we uh, create a modern polymath in today's society? Well, I had a program uh, that was trying to do this kind of a thing. And when I thought of the stuff that we were teaching this program, I decided one day to put it in the form of a standard you know, four credit classes, four classes per semester. Look like that. Um, the normal course, undergraduate course, is 128 to 140 credits, uh, 32 to 40 courses. Add 16 on top of that, to add plus your master's thesis in order to graduate. The program that we put together in New Mexico, if it was in this form, would have had uh, 222 courses and 778 credits. Uh, people had to do four published papers. They had to have worked on 20 significant projects or more during the time that they were in the program. Um, Twenty-five years, if you put it in the standard educational format. You ready to go back to school for 25 years? Luckily, there's a way around that problem. And you can't read this slide, so I'm going to read it to you. Uh, imagine for a moment. You can even close your eyes and imagine uh, that you're in a studio in Renaissance Florence. Advanced apprentices, a master, uh, novice apprentices, at minimum, are present in this room. They're working shoulder to shoulder. The apprentice with the master are working on the same things, doing sculpture, painting, goldsmithing, even poetry. Uh, you can have multiple masters in the room at the same time. 
the spectrum of younger apprentices in the room want to learn at least one of these disciplines, and most of them want to learn two or three of these disciplines because they're being shown how they integrate and how they interrelate. It's a storefront where you're actually producing things for paying customers, so you've got immediate feedback on whether you're doing things correctly or not. A workshop that is engaged in the craft and building the tools, discovering the techniques. It's noisy with multiple projects and activities. Uh, benches where you've got works in progress and exemplars. You know, your, your statue of David or your model for your statue of David is over there in the corner. And I know that was Michelangelo, not Leonardo, but um, the horse that, uh, uh, that Leonardo designed. It's an intellectual center, so when people are wandering around the country, they always say, we're going to drop by the studio and we're see, going to see what's going on there, because it's a, a center of innovation. Uh, it's very self-consciously multi- and interdisciplinary, mixes theory and practice. One of the big, thing, big problems we face today is that the practice is dissociated from the academic theory. It's a fountain of innovation and creativity. It's a place to share food, drink, music, Maybe even sleep um, if you had a late day. Uh, now, if you, if you can imagine that curriculum that I had on the board a minute ago, uh, there's a way of actually developing that. And the program that I had in New Mexico did that for a year and a half until the president of the university canceled it arbitrarily uh, about two years before he was sent to federal prison for uh, embezzlement and all kinds of other bad things. So, uh, I always have to throw that in because I really didn't like the guy. Uh, he, he canceled my program, but it worked. Uh, we had uh, 21 students in that first one. 15 of them published papers in referee conferences, including the Agile Conference and UPLA, which at that time were the two toughest conferences to get things published or, or to get things presented. So that's it. Thank you very much.